Hi, welcome to Time Warp Wife Ministries. I'm your host, Darlene Schacht, and today we're going through our Christmas devotional book called Prepare Him Room. I just want to let you know that you can find this book on Amazon.com. And if for any reason you can't afford a copy of the book, just go to the website at timewarpwife.com and hit the subscribe button and you'll get access to our members only section where you'll be able to download this book and other ones that we have done in the past. The book is divided into four sections. So we have hope, peace, joy, and love. What's really interesting is that when I was writing the book, there are seven chapters in each section, but what I found is that the chapters felt disconnected when I was writing them. Like I was writing on the topic of hope, but it didn't really feel like they were connected in any way. But as soon as I started to go through the study myself and do it a second time, this time not as a writer, but as someone who's really studying the word and absorbing myself in this book, I found that it all fit together so beautifully. And I think you might notice that too. I just absolutely love it. As I was answering one question, I noticed that the next chapter kind of reinforced what I just wrote in the last chapter. So I found that to be really, really cool. So we're gonna open our study guide up to day one, and I'm going to be reading from page two. So um, let's see, I wanna read a section there. It says, God's plan for the birth of his son was far from what anyone expected. A young, unmarried girl, a simple, uncomfortable stable. It was messy and humble. But God's plans are always perfect, even when they unfold in unconventional ways. Mary and Joseph didn't know how everything, how everything would play out. They couldn't see the whole picture, but they chose to trust. Because they did, the Savior of the world was born in that little stable, bringing light to the world. When I got to thinking about the surprising detours that God takes us on, I was reminded of moving into this house. And I, I've said it before in other studies that we moved about an hour away from the city because at the time when we sold our last house, we only had a couple of weeks to find the new one. So when I saw this house, I really liked it. It's really cute and it's perfect for a little retirement home. But I was saying to Michael, I like it, but I feel so far away from the kids. Like the kids live an hour away and my daughter now, she lives four hours away from us. So that part of it really kind of bothered me. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to trust the Lord. We're going to move here. And it is such a wonderful city. This is like, I think our city is the most Christian city in Canada or something like that. So that part is really cool. And also what I found is that one of our boys moved back home. So even when you feel like maybe God is taking me somewhere where I don't really want to be, it's quite often something that is so good for you and you just don't see it yet. If we're trusting God and we allow him to lead us, we'll always find that he has our best interest at heart. Um, God is working behind the scenes even when we don't see it. We think, Lord, I don't know if I want to do this or I don't know if I want to do that, but I'm going to trust you. And I can only imagine what Mary and Joseph felt like that night, thinking, wait a minute, this isn't the perfect plan that we had for this child. We wanted to have this child at home in a comfortable place, in a bed with blankets. And here we are in a stable. Lord, this isn't what we had planned for our lives, but it's what God had planned. And it turned out to be such a beautiful revelation of God's love for the world. And that's often the way it is in our life, isn't it? We think that we have it all figured out, but then we find out, wait a minute, God has different plans for me and that's okay too. So I want to tell you how it did work out for us. So we're living in this house and Nathaniel decided to move back home. So now we have one of our kids living with us again full time and he's able to go to school out here. So that's great. He's made friends out here and we love it. We love having him live with us. And because my daughter lives four hours away, when she comes out to visit now, which is about once a month, 
she lands up spending about four days with us, which is so good because we get to see the grandkids for those four days straight and we get to spend so much time with them. So even though we thought this wasn't a path that we would normally take, God blessed us. And that is the beauty of trusting him because you know that you know that God has your best interest at heart. And he's always um, working out things for the best, sometimes not how we deem them to be best, but he loves us more than we can ever imagine. And we really need to lean into that. I wanna read something else on page six of the book. It says, there's a common mindset that says, when my circumstances change, I'll be happy. But the truth is, if we're not happy with less, we won't be happy with more. Paul offers us a better way of leave of Paul offers us a better way of living, removing the crutch we're so used to leaning on. He writes, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That's Philippians 4:12. Paul's secret has nothing to do with the changing world around him. It's about the spirit living within him. Having the spirit inside me has made all the difference in my life. I had five miscarriages, and I probably mentioned that before, but one of them I lost at five months long, and it was just really difficult. And I think that one was on Christmas because I know a couple of them happened on Christmas. We were sitting in the waiting room just um, spending our Christmas in there. And I remember one Christmas Eve, I was in the doctor's office just waiting to see if the baby was okay or if we had lost it. And it, it was a difficult time, but there's this hope that I have, that I have five children living beyond the scope of this world. And that's the hope that I cling to, the hope I hold on to. And that's what really makes a difference in my life. Because regardless of what my circumstances here might be, I know that I have an anchor that I can hold on to and one that is firm and secure. And that's the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And something happened since the last time I talked to you. So I think this is probably why this is on my mind all the more maybe. Um, so we had a bull mastiff and uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful dog. And uh, she was only eight years old, but she got congestive heart failure. And we took her to the vet and um, we were going to start getting some tests done with her. But then within the next couple of days, she just passed away. We took her back to emergency and she died in the back of the car. And so it was just a really difficult week for me. And then on top of that, my oldest sister died too. But here's the thing about my sister. She had an accident about five months ago. Uh, it was five months and five days um, before she passed away. And so we had this five months to spend with her. Um, the way that the accident had left her, like she had a really bad fall. And so at first she was in a coma and then when she came out of the coma, she was almost completely paralyzed and her eyes were really bad too. And she was able after a while to start talking, but her talking was so um, jumbled, we had no idea what she was saying to us. And I could tell that it frustrated her all the time. But every time that we talked about Jesus, she would have her hands up and she would just be praising God. So on the last few days when it looked like things were not looking up for her and, and we thought that we were gonna lose her, um, I just felt this warmth when I was around her, this excitement that she had. And I knew that I knew that she couldn't wait to go home to Jesus. And that was just such a beautiful thing. She had a baby as well that she lost at birth and his name was Andrew. And her whole life, she talked about that one day when she would meet Andrew again. And then she had her husband who was there and and my mom and dad and aunts and uncles. And I just knew that she's in a better place and that helped me watch her go because I find that the older I get, 
I'm suffering all the more with loss and it just seems so real to me. But then the more I read the Bible, I'm experiencing hope all the more as well. And that is such a beautiful thing. And it really not only gives me strength to get through the hard times, it empowers me to be joyful and to be thankful with what I have. And so that's what I really believe that Paul's secret was. It's that spirit within him, that spirit that's reminding him that he wasn't made for this world. There's a question on page 11 that says, how does the story of Abraham and Sarah waiting for Isaac encourage you in your own seasons of waiting? I think the fact that Abraham was already, I think he was 100 years old when Isaac was born, and Sarah was way past the age of childbearing, it teaches me two things. One is that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, and that's my favorite Bible verse. And the other thing is that our timetable is not the same as God's. And sometimes those things that we long for or those things that we pray for can take a lifetime. And that doesn't mean that God has given up on us. Someone reminded me one day about all the prayers that I've had in the past, those prayers that I had in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, everything that I prayed for and asked God for and everything that I thanked God for, those prayers are just as fresh to God now as they were back then. God doesn't forget those things that we prayed for. He keeps them in his heart. He remembers them. And even though we might have forgot that we have been praying for someone or that we have been asking for God to intervene in a situation. It might be something that we've forgotten about long ago already, but God didn't forget. And he's still working on those things. And that just kind of crossed my mind today. And I thought, that's really cool. And when you look at the story of Abraham and Sarah, even though they might have thought, mm, we're, you know, it's too late now. We're not asking God anymore. We asked God for a child years ago. Maybe they had already given up on that that thought, but God remembered their prayers. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to know that God hears us and he sees us and he remembers us and he loves us. And so I just want to encourage you to keep that hope alive, not just through this Christmas season, but through the year and through the next year and on, because God doesn't give up on you. Don't give up on him. Those things that you pray for, those things that you long for, keep praying for them. If you're praying that someone you know will be saved, keep praying for them. Keep bringing them before the Lord and don't give up on God. Maybe you're facing a challenge this Christmas or having a difficult day. If you're suffering loss or struggling with fear, lower your anchor, my friend, and let his faithfulness hold you firm and secure. More than a wish for better days ahead, I underline that in my study guide because I think that is so important. Hope is more than a wish for better days ahead. Hope is there to remind us that God is not done. How do we embrace the spirit of hope? The same way that the trees do in this chapter, I'm talking about trees and, and how they get life from the water and their roots dig down into the soil. So we embrace the spirit of hope in the same way. We soak in his word to grow stronger in faith. We trust in God who is mighty to save. And when the winds of adversity rise up and roar, we stand on his promises firm and secure. One of the questions says, what does it mean to abide in Christ? And the second part says, how does this help us bear fruit? even during challenging times. Some of the ways that I wrote down for abiding in Christ are probably the most obvious ones, which is um, reading the Bible, praying and singing hymns. But there's also another one that I thought was really important, and that is doing. The reason that I think doing these things, you know, not just reading and praying, but doing what the word says, is that we learn and we practice. And 
because we practice, we grow from it. The fruit of the spirit, let me see if I can remember them off the top of my head. It's love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those things don't come to us overnight just because we ask Jesus to come into our heart and forgive our, of our sins. That doesn't mean that we're gonna wake up tomorrow and be long suffering. There's still gonna be people who get on our nerves. We're still gonna have the tendencies that we had the day before. And so it's important that every day we are dying to ourselves and we are walking in the light, practicing those things that we have learned from God's word. And that is how we abide in him. We keep walking in that light and bearing the fruit because we're practicing to be loving. We're practicing the kindness that we read about in scripture. We're practicing temperance, and that is a hard one for some people. You know, some people have been so used to flying off the handle all their life, but it can be really hard then to start changing those things. But the more that we practice and the more that we draw close to God, the more the spirit inside us empowers us. It's not something that we do on our own. Like Paul said, the secret is um, Christ in me. And it is that power working in us and through us that helps us to do these things. I think sometimes people assume that, you know, as soon as you become a Christian, you should put on this Pollyanna attitude where everything is good and nothing bothers me and I shouldn't cry, I shouldn't mourn, I should just be happy all the time. And that really only lasts um, so long if you're doing it on your own strength. But when you have the power of the Holy Spirit behind you, that's when you begin to see real change because you're changing from the inside out. It's that, that water, just like a tree is getting. You know, we're praying and we're asking God to help us. And the Holy Spirit is reminding us of these things. The Holy Spirit is strengthening us. And as we're reading the word, we're learning from the word. So it's not just that we're learning by doing these things, we're learning by reading about them. We see how did someone like um, Jesus handle temptation? How did Peter handle regret? How did Job handle loss? And when we learn about the people who have come before us and how they faithfully clung to God, we have them for examples so that we can learn and we abide in God by learning his word, by praying that he will strengthen us and help us. And I love the part about singing too, because I do that a lot in the car. I have to tell you, I'm a little bit annoying with my car music because I love Jamie Grace a little bit too much. You know, the old album that she had where, oh, who's she singing with? I love the way you hold me. Oh, I love it so much. And my kids are like, yeah, we know that, Mom. We know that. We've heard it a million times. <laughs> I, I'm kind of like that. I'm still like, you know, listening to Amy Grant and all these people from the 80s. Once I like music, it, it's really hard for me to give up on it. So, all right, let's go on and read from page 18. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. The tongue can also be used to build up and breathe life into others. Can you think of a better time to do that than now? The holidays give us countless opportunities to share hope with those around us, whether we're standing in line at the mall or sitting down with friends for a meal. A few words of encouragement can go a long way. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul writes, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. This call to encourage one another goes beyond simply being nice. When we encourage others, we help them overcome adversity and grow stronger in their faith. There's a question on page 19 that says, can you think of a situation where someone's words had a big impact on, there's a spelling mistake there, sorry, <laughs> on you in either a positive or negative way? I have to tell you that Negative um, comments cut so much deeper than kind ones lift you. I think that I can get 
a hundred great comments where people are really encouraging me and saying, oh, I love this Bible study. Thank you so much. But then you get one negative comment and that's the one that really eats away at you, isn't it? And so we can learn from that, that our words can cut people deeply. It's a really good reminder to us to just watch what we say, use our words to edify other people and really be careful about being negative to them. I know that it's really tempting, especially if you can be anonymous on the internet and so many people are, they're using the, how do you say that? Anonymity? They're using their anonymity. Yeah, that sounds better. To, um, to really cut people down. And it's so discouraging to see that. But we have the opportunity to be lifting people up. And you know, the negative comments can really stay with us for years. But so can the good ones. I remember when I was really young and I decided to help my mom and dad move a couch. Maybe I was like six or something. And here I was just trying to lift on one end with my mom pretending that I was helping because I thought I was. And I remember her saying at the time, Darlene is so strong. She is such a good helper. Something I learned to do too when I was a mom. But um, it really stuck with me. And so through the years, I wanted to be that person that I was labeled as. And I think the negative comments can do that too. Sometimes we just live up to those things that we've been labeled as. There was another one one time where a woman at church had said to me, you have such a servant's heart. And this was like, you know, in the early 90s, and I remember thinking, wow, I'm, I got a servant's heart. Okay, you know, maybe after church, I should be helping all the time. So here I am stacking chairs and stuff like that after church, wiping tables, because I'm thinking I have a servant's heart. That's what I've been labeled as now. But it really goes to show you that our words have so much more power than sometimes we imagine. And um, I just want to remind you that during this Christmas season, our words can really be a gift to someone. They can be used to encourage others and to lift them up and to remind them how much they're loved by God. Some lives have been so damaged by the things that have been said to them. And we have an opportunity to help that healing by allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us, to remind them how much they're loved by God and that can really start a healing process in someone's life and draw them closer to God. We hear testimonies all the time about people whose lives have changed because of one thing that was said to them. And what if that one thing that you're hesitating to say to someone is the very thing that could draw them closer to Christ? Just be sensitive to God's leading and let him work through you because you never know this Christmas might be the time when God uses you for something wonderful. Going on to chapter six, the bottom of page 21 says, imagine all that the people endured while waiting for Christ. Centuries of slavery in Egypt, years of wandering in the wilderness, periods of captivity in Babylon, and generations under foreign rulers. Through all of this, God's people clung to the promise of the Messiah waiting and trusting that in God's perfect timing, deliverance would come. It's incredible how long they waited for the Messiah when you really look at it, isn't it? And yet, when we look at our own lives, we're stressed out if we have to wait like a couple of months for God to answer a prayer, or a couple of years, we're thinking, Lord, did you not hear my prayers? Lord, are you not listening to me? Lord, do you not care? And when we look at that and see that God was faithful to his promises throughout scripture, we can apply that to our own lives and say, you know what? God has not forgotten us. God is still at work in our lives and he's not working on our timetable as much as we like to think that he is sometimes. According to Psalm 37, this is on page 23, it says, what actions are we encouraged to take while we wait on the Lord? Can you name six? Okay, let's read that together first. Um, open your Bible to Psalm 37 and see if we can find six actions that we're encouraged to take 
while we wait on the Lord. I have to tell you that earlier when I was doing my homework on this, I couldn't find a single one. I'm looking at this thinking, how can I find six? I can't even find one. And then I realized I was in chapter 36 instead of 37. So once I flipped over to 37, I found quite a few. So the first two, I didn't really count in my six because these are things that you should not do. And I wanted to list six things that you should do. So it says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Then here comes the parts that I had written down. So trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. I think that part, verse seven, has really been a theme that I've been talking about today, which is being still before God, bring our burdens to him, bring our prayer requests to him, but then be still and let God do his work and, and trust that he will do what's best for our lives. It might not be answered in the way that we want or when we want our prayers to be answered, but God has our best interest at heart. And let's remember that as we are praying and as we're bringing our burdens to him. We're still on verse seven. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. I think what I really got from that chapter is that we need to leave our vindication, our revenge, our sorrow, our hurt, and our pain in God's hand and really trust that he's a righteous God and that he is a righteous judge and that he will take care of those things that have hurt us. And sometimes we feel like, but but I've been hurt and, and I, I don't want to hurt. I want them to know how much I hurt. But it's okay to leave it in the hands of God because we can trust that he is not forgetful, that he will remember and that he will handle our problems wisely. And I love that about him, that he is so faithful and that he is loving and compassionate. Even when we don't feel like maybe he's compassionate to our situation, maybe we feel like God doesn't understand exactly what we're going through. He, he does. He knows what we're going through and he knows what suffering is like because he suffered so much himself. We're on to the last chapter in the section on hope and reading from page 26. I wanted to close with this thought. I know that many of you have suffered great loss, some as recently as this year. I know a lot of you are dealing with sickness and pain, financial burdens and broken relationships. And even if I don't know you by name, there may be a struggle that you're going through too. So I encourage you, if you're looking for joy in your sorrow, hope through despair and peace in the midst of uncertainty, cling to the promises of God that he's given us in his word. Here are a few of them that I've listed. A promise to never leave you or forsake you. That's Deuteronomy 31.6. A promise to give strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. Isaiah 40 verse 29. That his grace is sufficient for you. That's 2 Corinthians 12, 9, a promise that he works all things together for the good of those who love him. That's Romans 8, 28, a promise that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Isaiah 40, verse 31. And the question here on 27 says, is there a particular promise that you can hold on to or already do in your current season of life? 
And my answer is that with the recent passing of my sister, because her memorial was just yesterday and she just passed away like about a week ago, that death feels all too real and life feels like it's passing me by so quickly. I know that I'm gonna face loss and more loss the older I get. And so I cling to the hope that I find in scripture. And this is the same hope that my dad had when he was on his deathbed. And it really encouraged me and helped me to get through that season of my life. And that promise is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 14. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open it up with me because this promise is so good and this is the perfect, perfect one to leave you with on this topic of hope. It says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Isn't that beautiful? I love that assurance from God. And then going down to verse 16, there's a little more. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. What a beautiful reunion that's going to be in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so we can all be with the Lord forever. You know what else I look forward to is meeting a lot of you, not in this life, but we're gonna have to wait until we get to that next life, won't we? So many of you live so far away and, and I really wanna have a little spot on my porch for you so that each one of you can come and just sip tea with me one afternoon and really talk about the goodness of Jesus and how much we're enjoying the new place that we're in. And I know it's going to be a beautiful place. And I know that reunion is going to be a wonderful experience. And I also know that the things that are weighing us down here on the earth, whether it's depression or a sickness that we have or insecurity or addiction, that those things are just going to fall away. And that too is something that we can look forward to. So that is all that I have for this chapter on hope. And I pray that you're having a wonderful Christmas. Make sure that you dig into the chapters of uh, not only this book, but at the beginning of each chapter, I've also mentioned a chapter or a section of the Bible that you should read because that is really where we're gonna get the meat of God's word, not from the words that I say, but from the Holy Spirit and from the words that God has written in his word. So make sure that you're digging into that. And again, prepare him room, 28 ways to embrace the spirit of Christmas. So that's all we have for today and I will talk to you later. So have a great week. Bye-bye.